welcome to the Explores. Time traveling through history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. This past month, September 2020, I started publishing a new kind of bonus over on my Patreon page. They're called minisodes, 10 to 15 minute dives into things I haven't gotten to cover on the show in depth. There's the What She Wore series about the history of women's fashion and the She Did What series about trailblazing female inventors. My latest bonus, though, I'm kind of obsessed with it. It grew and grew, becoming so full of fun facts that I find myself bursting to share them. And so, while I put the finishing touches on the final two episodes in our series on Rome's imperial ladies, I'm dropping it here for all to enjoy. If you like it, consider becoming a patron. You'll get access to hours of bonus material, and your support goes a long way to keeping the show going. And now, on with the show. It's an experience shared by many. It's the end of the day, and you're peeling off whatever bra you've just spent many hours in, breathing a little sigh of relief. That garment you've just tossed onto the floor isn't one we often give a lot of thought to, unless it's not doing what it's supposed to do. But it's been a staple of most women's wardrobes for centuries, supporting breasts, hiding and exposing them, shaping the silhouette we wear into the world. We have this notion that bras and corsets were invented by men to confine women, to keep them from moving freely, bound up tightly for the viewer's pleasure. But they appear throughout time because they're also about practicality and freeing women to do the things they want to do. If you happen to have breasts, dear listener, you know the incredible discomfort of, say, riding a horse at full speed or doing jumping jacks with no bra on. If you don't happen to have a pair, don't worry. Imagine two balloons full of sand and maybe pudding strapped to your chest forever. A friend, who is much more generously endowed than I am, recently went on a bike ride through the rain while brawless, and described to me the incredible discomfort of, as she put it, her sweet chariots hanging low. Love them or hate them, bras have always been with us, and they have a long and deliciously interesting history. You can discover a lot about women in history just by tracing how their necklines rise and fall, how much cleavage they're showing, and how the most desirable breast shape changes. So let's head out on an expedition through time to explore the evolution of our sweet chariot holders and all the shapes they've taken over time. I'm also going to take this opportunity to introduce you to some glorious historical terms for our bosoms, because who doesn't love a bit of time-traveling slang, am I right? I'll earmark them with the year they first appear in print. You're welcome. Grab some strips of old sheet, a few gel inserts, and a tissue or two. Let's go traveling. This episode is brought to you by my patrons. And now, a shout out to a few of them. To my newest pirate queen, Hannah, and my newest lady presidents, Laura, Ernst, Samantha, Paige, and Abigail. And to the Imperators and Augustas who give me more each month than I ask for. Jackie C, Dylan, Jessica S, Karen C, and Avery. As we've discovered in Season 2, the bra goes all the way back to the ancient world. At least we think so. Cloth doesn't age well, so artwork is pretty much all we have to go on. In ancient Minoan art, women are depicted with a band of cloth around their lady orbs. It's been called an apodesmos, a woolen contraption that it seems was wrapped around the front and fastened with pins in the back. Other Minoan art shows women wearing a corset-like garment, though we're not really clear how often these were worn and by whom. But it is clear the ancient Greeks knew some things about constraining one's tatas. In Book 14 of Homer's Iliad, he describes the goddess Aphrodite's appearance thusly. She loosed from her bosom the curiously embroidered girdle into which all her charms had been wrought. A lot of scholars refer to this as Aphrodite's belt, but the references to letting free her golden apples make it sound much more like a bra. The Greeks also have a lot to say about the breasts of the Scythians, the term they used for the nomadic horse-riding tribes who wandered on the Eurasian steppe. It makes sense that they'd want to bind their breasts for practicality, and there's evidence to suggest they sometimes wore leather armor to do it. You try galloping full speed while shooting a bow and arrow without a bra on. 
In Greece, some women wore a strophion, or a simple cloth band. In Rome, it was called a strophium. It's unclear if all women wore them, or just certain women in certain situations, but all you have to do is look at an ancient Greek statue to know that huge jugs were not their beauty ideal. Many women wore these breastbands to keep the ladies contained, focusing attention on the curve of the hips and their potential for childbearing. And of course, just like in every era, there are men who had opinions about what women should do with them. Ovid, for one, wrote that if breasts weren't quite the right shape, women should stuff their bras. Thanks for the super hot tip, Ovid. Going by the ancient sources, respectable women were known to keep their strophium on during sexy time, which may just be because they weren't that easy to take off. They also seem to have worn them when they went out for a workout. The famous Roman Bikini Girls mosaic from the Villa Romana de Casale in Sicily, dating back to the 4th century CE, shows women exercising at a gymnasium in what looks like a strapless bra and bikini briefs. Was this standard issue for women wanting to get their sweat on? We don't really know, but they were clearly a thing. Meanwhile, in the non-Western world, women were also looking for ways to contain the ladies. In India, the first mention of the bra dates back to writings from the first century CE. In ancient China, there were several bra-like situations, all of which I am very sure I'm about to mispronounce. There's the Zayi, a tunic style worn in the Han Dynasty about 200 BCE, and the Moxyang, a one-piece garment worn around 500 CE. A lot of these are breast-binding garments meant to strap the ivory balls, 1600, down for a range of reasons. So when do bras as we might recognize them come onto the scene? We're going to define the bra as something with two distinct cups for your sweet melons to rest in, and they came into existence a lot earlier than you might think. In 2008, at Langberg Castle, Austria, researchers found four linen biddies that date to the medieval period, between 1390 and 1485. All four of them look startlingly like the tattered remains of modern bras. A few of these proto brassieres feature cups sewn into a cropped tank top type garment, which rises to cover the cleavage area and would have served as an underlayer. Another looks a lot like what's called a longline bra in the 1950s. It has cups made from pieces of linen, with some surrounding fabric extending down to the bottom of the ribs. It has eyelets on the left side for tightening, much in the same way you might lace up a corset. All of them have lacy decorations for a little something extra special. Turns out we've been combining function and fashion in our bras for a very, very long time. We don't know how widely such garments were worn, but we do know that men like to write about them. You know what's an unsexy term for a bra? Breast bags. Henri de Monville, surgeon to Philip the Fair of France and his successor, Louis X, wrote the following in the 1310s. Some women insert two bags in their dresses, adjusted to the breasts, fitting tight, and they put them, the breasts, into them, the bags, every morning and fasten them when possible with a matching band. While the purpose here seems to have been to strap the ladies down, another writer, Conrad Stoll, complained in the 1480s about bras that flattered the ladies. Paps. 1500, a bit too well, describing them as... All indecent. You know what, Conrad? No one asked you. Yet another 15th century satirical poet from Germany described so-called breast bags in which a woman... Roams the streets so that all the young men that look at her can see her beautiful breasts, but whose breasts are too large makes tight pouches, so there is no gossip in the city about her big breasts. It seems that these bras were meant to support one's globes, 1650, but also to enhance them, depending on one's aim and preference. Which brings us, of course, to the corset. Yep, we're going there. The corset was the essential shaping garment for fashionable women in the Western world from the Renaissance period through to the early 20th century. As with all underwear fashion, it's hard to say when it hit the scene or who coined the term. In medieval times, the word corset was associated with a kind of cloak worn by men. Early corsets first show up in the 1300s, though in some ways they're more about achieving the right look around the waist area than about shaping our heavers. 1670s. 
The medieval look demanded a long, slim waist, with a tight bodice enhanced by a low-slung decorative belt at the hips. To get the look, women wore what was called a coat, spelled C-O-T-T-E. This garment started out as outerwear, worn by both men and women over their shirts. But by the 16th century, it had become something the ladies wore underneath. This linen underbodice was described as a soft body shaper worn over a woman's shift, kind of like a long underslip. With time, these got stiffer and more rigid. Etymology fun fact. In modern French, the word survives in the expression cote de mai, or chainmail. And the old French coat gave rise to the word cotillon, or cotillion, a kind of dance. And in fact, a kind of dance that many women were forced to wear corsets to. We'll come back to this later. By the 17th century, it had split into two pieces, a core, spelled like corpse, for the top half, run through with steel stays to hold its shape, and a coat, or skirt, for the bottom. We'll mostly be calling the corset our stays up until the 19th century. Some of these were just bodice shapers, but they had a profound effect on shaping and supporting Cupid's Kettle Drums, 1775. Well, not support like you're thinking. These early corsets didn't have separate cups to keep the ladies flying high. Made with whalebone and later with steel, they would mold us into an inverted cone shape, turning us all into bushel bubbies. 1780, or a woman with large-looking breasts, giving them that cup-runneth-over look popular with court ladies for several centuries to come. Queen Mary II of England in the 1600s, for one, and Marie Antoinette in the 1700s, and many of Europe's most fashionable wore high-waisted, neoclassical gowns that were all about that cleavage. This French-inspired style featured low, square necklines that swung dangerously close to the nipple area, and our stays were what turned our exposed orbs into fetching, pushed-up half-moons. But not everyone wanted to expose their cat's heads. 1811, for a public consumption. Whatever period shows, like the Tudors might try to tell you, ladies were not generally wandering around in the corset without anything underneath. Many women in these eras covered up their cleavage with things like the fichu, an often linen cloth wrapped around the neck and tucked into the bodice for modesty's sake. Those who didn't got more and more hate from male critics. There's a fine line, it seems, between fashion boldness and looking like a common harlot, which is of course a bad thing. I roll. Several publications in 1700s England advised against women unmasking their beauties. Because, as one put it, otherwise polite, genteel women look like common prostitutes. By this time, many were questioning the corset for its potentially damaging effects on a woman's health. Suffragettes in the Victorian era were convinced that the corset not only kept the ladies from breathing, but also from legal emancipation. And besides, how was one to ride the newfangled bicycle with their ribs so very constrained? But the controversial history of the corset is a rabbit hole best left for another minisode. So let's get to how it turned into the modern bra. As styles changed, moving toward the S-Bend silhouette that got popular around the turn of the 20th century, corsets shifted with them, becoming more about shaping the torso and less about giving any bust support. So people started looking for new ways to keep their bosom from looking like what the Australians once called a drooping bag of snakes. 1910. Patents for boob-only undergarments actually go as far back as the 1860s. In 1889, a French lady named Herminie Cadol presented her corselet gorge, or corset divided in two, at a Paris fashion show. The bottom piece was a tube that hugged the body, while the top piece was meant to hold up one's knockers. 1930. Over the next few years, Cadol refined her invention, showing it off for the first time at the Great Exhibition in Paris in 1889. It was called a soutien-gorge by then, which literally translates to throat support, and was being sold separately from the corset. This is where the bra as we know it took shape. This is also when we started seeing it called a brassiere. Here's an excerpt from New York's Evening Herald from 1893. 
Those ladies who wish to be in the real absolute fashion are adopting for evening wear the six-inch straight bone band, or brassiere, which Sarah Bernhardt made a necessity with her directoire gowns. Another super fun etymology side note, the word brassiere comes from the French for upper arm. Originally, it seems, it was used to describe a soldier's arm guard or shield, and then a military breastplate. But it started showing up as a term for women's undies in the early 1900s. By 1911, it was in the Oxford English Dictionary. But it wasn't until 1914, when the United States Patent and Trademark Office granted Mary Phelps Jacobs a patent, that we officially got an invention called a brazier. And so we circle back to a lady at a cotillion having a corset wardrobe malfunction. In 1913, on the eve of her debutante ball in Manhattan, a 19-year-old Mary was dealing with a serious problem. The fashionable dresses of her era were slim, tight, and boxy, with low-cut necklines. That night, her sheer gown was being ruined by her bulky corset. The eyelid embroidery of my corset cover kept peeping through the roses around my bosom, she wrote later. So she asked her maid to bring her two pocket handkerchiefs and some pink ribbon, and they got to sewing. What they made was quite simple, two thin pieces of material stitched in such a way that they created subtle cups. When the ribbons were pulled tight and tied together, you had something very much like a halter top bikini and a level of support not altogether different than what the corset would offer, but without the breath-crushing whaleboning. She said the feeling of wearing it was delicious. I could move more freely, a nearly naked feeling. And in the glass, I saw that I was flat and proper. The other ladies at the party that night were amazed. I'll have what she's having. So she went on to show her contraption around to friends and in Manhattan dressing rooms, playing around with different versions. On February 12, 1914, she filed for a patent. Nine months later, her backless brassiere was born. Of course, corsets had been around for so long by this point that they weren't going to be easy to get rid of. Mary, who would later change her name to the much more fabulous Caress Crosby, did get a few department store hits, but it was slow going. I can't say the brassiere will ever take as great a place in history as the steamboat, Mary said later, but I did invent it. In a very stupid man move, her husband, whose name is Dick, because of course it is, pressured her to sell the patent to the Warner Brothers Corset Company for $1,500. Not a small sum at the time, but I'll bet he was sorry for it later. Because lucky for the people who owned that patent, America was about to enter World War I. In 1917, the U.S. War Industries Board said, Ladies, we're entering a war here. Could you kindly stop buying steel banded corsets? This had two consequences. First, it physically freed women up to work in factories without being so constricted, making jobs like bomb assembly much easier. It also freed up America's steel supply for the war. How much steel, you wonder? Some 28,000 pounds of it, which was apparently enough to build two whole battleships. Way to go, ladies! Unsurprisingly, when the war was over, no one was super keen to put the corset back on. And times were changing for women. They'd won the right to vote, had increased access to education, and way more opportunities to work and play outside the home. They played sports as well, tennis being by far the most popular, and they wanted simple clothes to match their changing lifestyles. Lighter, cheaper to make, easier to move in. They wanted to free their waists and ribs as well, but they still wanted something to keep their dairy arrangements, 1923, from swinging in the breeze as they pranced. When it came to 1920s fashion, the tubular Le Garçon look dominated the decade. This look, which we associate with the flapper, is all about a dropped waist and a slim, columnar, almost boyish silhouette. To pull it off, you couldn't have cleavage or curves of any description. To that aim, some ladies bound their honeydews, 1920, in strips of old sheets to try and strap them down. It's no surprise, then, that there was room in the market for a bra that squashed. Nearly 200 patents for bras and corselets were registered from 1918 to 1929. Many of these were bandeau-style, meant to flatten you down and keep any cleavage hidden. 
They're quite cute, actually, and fairly easy to make at home in a pinch. Newfangled rayon made them look more luxurious, but kept them affordable, while wash-resistant dyes meant the colors wouldn't run. But not everyone was happy with the flat chest situation. Dressmakers Enid Bissett and Ida and William Rosenthal all thought it was unflattering. So Bissett got to work making something that would better accentuate a lady's assets, creating something with two distinct and supportive cups. William refined it, and the maiden form brassiere was born. At first, they just sewed it into their dresses, but then ladies started asking for it to be sold separately. By 1929, the three had closed their shop and formed the Maiden Form Brazier Co. They're also often credited with giving us our cup sizes. At first, bras were one-size-fits-all, made out of a stretchy material that was supposed to work for everyone. But then came A, B, C, and D cups. To me, this sounds very much like the American grading system, but apparently they represent ounces. A cup is 8 ounces, B is 13, C is 21, and D is 27. Bras and yogurt containers have more in common than I thought. While some say that Made in Form brought us this sizing system, others say it was S.H. Camp and Company. Either way, they were here to stay. Bras really came into their own in the 1930s. Besides distinct cup sizes for better fit, there was the adjustable elastic strap and the introduction of eye hooks. The bra became less about squashing breasts down and more about making them shapely. Underwire became more common, much to my dismay, though it didn't really take off until after World War II, when metal was no longer needed for the war effort. Who knew that the World Wars had such a profound effect on our shapewear? Some had wire arching over the breasts, which helped keep their shape while getting rid of all cleavage. A good thing for mid-century ladies wearing evening dresses with plunging fronts, apparently. When it comes to sex symbols in America, suddenly it's all about butter babies. 1980, a slang term for a full-figured woman. Now that boobs were back in fashion, the shape and material of our bras made a big difference. And then in the 1940s, Hollywood got involved. Aviator, playboy, and all-around weirdo Howard Hughes designed an aerodynamic bra for Jane Russell to wear in his 1941 film The Outlaw. He called it the cantilever bra, and he was very precise about its purpose, saying that The length of the actual cleavage is five and one quarter inches. Getting a little bit too involved there, Howard. In that same decade, Frederick Mellinger started Fredericks of Hollywood, which catered mostly to the starlets who so often set our fashion trends. He came up with the first front hook bra and the Rising Star, a padded push-up full of so-called Cheaters. 1949, to make the most of what we got. These bras weren't just for function, far from it. They helped usher in the era of the so-called bullet bra or torpedo bra. You know, that pointy, pyramidal cup shape that defined much of the 1950s and into the 60s, though they really got their start in the 40s. I've found sources that say they became popular not because of Hollywood alone, but because women started working on production lines during World War II. Some even claimed these points offered extra protection in the workplace. Really? Some required their workers to wear them as part of their uniform, it seems, or for the purpose of keeping up morale. Um, excuse me? I don't know about that, but I do know that Made in Form applied to the government during the war for a Declaration of Essentiality, arguing that America's newly working women needed bras, and therefore they should be able to keep making them. They marketed their brassiere as a vital necessity. Whatever keeps you afloat, you know? But it was movie stars who turned the bullet bra into a real fashion staple. Google the words Marilyn Monroe wears tight sweater and you'll know exactly what I mean. All the leading ladies of the time were wearing them, turning their Hooters 1952 into unmissable and delectable pyramids. Madonna brought the pointy bra back into our consciousness with her Gautier-designed cone bra on her Blonde Ambition tour in 1990. And the Wonder Bra was invented in the 1960s, though it took several decades to really take off. The hippies of the 1960s were not down with boob shapers. They became rather famous for not wearing any. 
In 1965, designer Rudy Gernreich took the trend for softer undies and invented his no-bra bra. bra. Made from sheer nylon and without any real structure, it put a thin barrier between our breasts and our clothing, but didn't do much else. As we rolled into the 1970s and 80s, though, bras changed again, just as women were being introduced to the joys of gel inserts and crazy cleavage to go under their power suits, they were also looking for something they could jog in. The sudden craze for running meant that a lot of women were hitting the pavement and finding that their bras were not up to the task. Lisa Lindahl and her friends Hinda Miller and Polly Smith knew that all too well. These budding joggers had spent the summer of 1977 going around trying to find bras that weren't terrible to run in. One day, Linda's husband made a funny, putting his jock strap on upside down over his chest, just like a bra, making the ladies laugh. But it got them to thinking, why isn't there essentially a jock strap for boobs? They laughed and laughed. But then they were like, no, but really. Two of them were costume designers, and though they knew very little about bras, they saw the possibilities. So Linda took her husband's jockstrap and sewed it together with another one. Okay, she thought, this could work. But the fabric wasn't right, so Polly went to New York City, bought sample yardage, and made a prototype. Linda tested it out by going running in it, and Hinda ran backwards in front of her to see how it moved. I really wish we could go back in time and see this whole thing in action. They originally called their invention the jock bra. Funny, ladies. But then, thankfully, they changed it to a jog bra. So next time you go to a yoga class or hop around to some Latin beat, feel grateful that your sweet chariots are securely tucked into their lycra, and know that you have three enterprising ladies to thank. And there you have it, a time-traveling look at the evolution of the bra. They have a lot to tell us about what ladies' lives were like in past centuries. They've cinched us in, flattened us down, and lifted us up in equal measure. But they've allowed us some freedom, too. So, as the marvelous Mrs. Maisel might say, tits up. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, tell a friend or leave a review wherever you listen. It really helps spread the word. You'll get access to more bonus episodes like this one by becoming a patron. To find out all about it, just go to my website, where you'll also find a transcript, images, and a list of my sources for this episode, including a link to that dictionary of slang. If you're looking for a good read, I'm an affiliate of bookshop.org, where you can buy books about women in history that I've curated on a shelf just for you. Every purchase helps support the show and independent bookstores, so a win all around. Come find me on Instagram or Facebook at The Explores Podcast and Twitter at The Explores Pod. Thanks to Paul Gablonski for my theme music logo and help producing this episode. And my brother John, as always, for being willing to shout slang words for breasts into his iPhone. <laughs> <laughs>